And welcome back, everyone. I'm here again with Laird Barron. We're going to talk a little bit about the current geopolitical situation. Uh, we'll probably start off with Russia. We could we could veer into other territory as well. But um, and and you know, Laird, what, what's your take on kind of? Uh, well, actually, before I before I ask you that. Um, just just a summary of what what's going on right now. So it's February twenty second. Um, this will probably air first, given that the situation keeps changing faster. In fact, uh, the I, I scheduled an interview with or had an interview yesterday with um, John Langan, and the the second topic we talked about was uh, Russia Ukraine. And by the time I woke up this morning, everything that we had talked about had uh, started to become um, history, mm. and so I so I published it this morning, even though it was supposed to go next week. So this one might this might this one might be coming sooner, based on what's going on. So we've we've been talking for uh, about two and a half hours at this point. So I haven't seen any news, you know, f- over that period. But before we started, Putin had. Uh, approved orders for Russian military to move into the Donbass um, region, which uh, is Luhansk and Donetsk. And uh, just for folks who know, the the part that is open right now is where the separatists were, which is about half of each province, which means there are Ukrainian troops still in those provinces that the Russians had declared as independent. Uh, Putin had given orders for his forces to to move in, and that's kind of where I am right now. At the same time, there's forces that are arrayed in the north that aren't anywhere near that situation. Um, on prior uh, you know episodes, I've always contended contended that I thought there would be kind of a dual thrust south to encircle Kiev which made sense with the forces, but there are also forces that are like in, in the far, far Western Belarus, which, you know, could be used to, you know, do a, a, a further uh, or a full scale invasion of all of, of all of Ukraine. In fact, I kind of ran a, an informal poll on Twitter and most people think that Putin's going to do a full scale invasion. I, I don't, I don't think he's that dumb. Um, I think the the like the smart money is on that thrust around Ukraine or Kiev, so that you can put a gun to the head of the, uh, you know, the, the the politicians there and like kind of do what you need to do, install a puppet, declare victory, and go home. But you know, I obviously could be wrong. Laird, with that build up, what's what's your what's your take on this on this uh, situation? Right, I'm no I'm no political expert. I but I did. You know, I have been mon- monitoring this uh, with alarm. My heart goes out to the people on the ground who are involved in this. So many, you know, they did a little uh, interview with a bunch of, uh, you know, Rus- uh, citizens of Russia who are just, you know, horrified. Um, so it, it, once again, it's a case, you know, of leaders take, you know, and probably a few, a few old uh, military guys taking, taking the whole country into madness. Um, which has always been right. That's it seems like that's always been the case. Uh, I think it's alarming that, that observers who know much more about it, historical observers, are alarmed at his speech yesterday, uh, essentially knocking him for, you know, almost almost raving lunacy in how he described Ukraine's history and its relation to Russia and how things have, have unfolded. You know, this is sort of a this is sort of a maniacal justification for what he's doing. Uh, as, as far as what happens, you know, just looking at th- things are so intertwined and complicated between the, the great powers. I think that I think that there is uh, I won't call it hope, but I guess it's the closest thing we have to hope that it may be a limited incursion that, in other words, let the old man because it seems like he wants to bring back Soviet, you know, the Soviet Union and the glories uh, go back to the glory days. And I don't think it's any coincidence that it's happening here in his twilight. Yeah, according um, to him, like he he believes that the Soviet the fall of the Soviet Union is the single biggest catastrophe of the 20th century. Right. Given everything that happened in the 20th century, that's what and, he thinks is the and, biggest and, catastrophe. And, and, and you know, and you kind of have this. I'm trying to think of 
you know, in the U.S. who we compare this to, uh, to some degree, less maniacal, but there was a certain element um, in in Bush Jr.'s, you know, uh, sort of rabid uh, intent to go after, you know, on any pretext to finish the job that daddy had had started. And so there's this, um, you know, obviously, I think Putin is a much more skillful, skillful uh, politician and operative and all that. But I, I do think we're starting to hear you know, maybe he's not all there anymore. And I do, I don't think it's, a, as I was going to say, I don't think it's a coincidence that this guy, this dictator, uh, in his twilight, most likely, is like, okay, this is my last chance to do this. Or maybe even I don't give a flying rat's ass anymore and I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And I thought that it was, uh, you know, I, like I said, I'm no expert in this. I'm simply going by what brighter people have been, an, you know, analysts. And there was some pushback earlier uh, when he was abroad recently before this all, you know, earlier this month, Putin, I forget where he was, but Putin was abroad and some of his uh, generals were, you know, recorded as basically, you know, almost treasonously, you know, saying, well, I don't know if we want to do this. And so there seems to be some evidence of pushback against him. And what we can hope is that, yeah, he's going to go in and do, do bad things, but it'll be like, okay, that's far enough. And, and as you say, you know, less of a full scale invasion and more of a, I won, you know, I, I reclaimed this territory, but it, it will be horribly, you know, it's going to be very dark to see what happens with how the world responds and how he in turn responds to that. Will Putin react to increasing international pressure with, you know, get kind of like, you know, he obviously has to walk that line being a dictator of I'm going to do what I'm going to do and you can't intimidate me. But he also, if he has any brain left, depending on how bad the um the sanctions are or or whatever uh the, the world decides to do you know how how much damage is he going to take at home on an economic level or a political level to, to to basically you know thump his chest and i, I we can only hope that um because he's already crossed the rubicon in the sense of he's invading we can only hope though that there's a limit to it and that the, the that the world stands united and and pushing back because if we don't push back by whatever methods uh, we have to, I, I think there's nothing really to, why would he stop? Yeah, and this, this is where, uh, you know, this is one of those things that it was kind of like a slow motion um, wreck, yeah. right? And, and yeah. that started, started at the end of the, the Cold War. And, you know, and again, this is, Part of this is, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to assess, you know, blame, but there are mistakes that we made that create, like helped, help generate the conditions to create this. Now, granted, I, like Putin is, you know, majority responsible for all of this, right? Because he's the one choosing to move the troops in. But what we, after the Cold War, we kept pushing the borders of NATO east when there really wasn't like a reason, you know, if, if I'm if I'm taking a non-US centric view, there really wasn't a reason for NATO to exist anymore, right? Because the reason it was created was in opposition to the Soviet Union, Warsaw Pact countries, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But what we did is we moved we moved the borders of NATO as far east as possible to Russians Russia's doorstep. But if you look at the the history of Russia, they've always had some sort of or at least tried to have some sort of a buffer. Be, and, you know, even with a buffer, they had the experience with Germany, you know, et cetera, in World War II, where they lost 27 million citizens. So we pushed the border all the kind of all the way to the east. And then at the same time, we withdraw most of our forces from continental Europe to back up that supposed you know, treaty. So I think right now there's two brigade combat teams, not including the the brigade sized element that we just sent over there. So we put ourselves into a position where we kind of threaten Russia with, you know, troops and, uh, you know, allies all along his border, but we don't have the muscle to defend it. So this is kind of in terms of Putin's timing, this is perfect for him because even if we wanted to stop it right now, there is nothing we could do 
to stop him from doing whatever he wants with Ukraine, at least in the short term. I don't think we have any appetite on either side of the aisle and probably not amongst the citizens, you know, the, the, the citizens of the United States, for example, to do any kind of a battle, you know, any kind of physical confrontation. I, you know, I mean, who knows bad things, you know, something starts and then there's a chain, you know, something blows up and then, yeah, you're in a war, but I don't, I really don't get the impression. I don't, I don't think there's any evidence that we want to, I don't sense that we want to protect no. Ukraine in that regard. And so I think it's going to come down to, uh, saner people in the room on both you know, on all sides actually trying to m- mitigate what you know this maniac what he's doing and you know justifications that he may have or not uh, in his own mind or historically you know in a, in a chess game sense um, he, he what he's doing is is is, is very foolhardy because it's going to have no matter what a, a very deleterious effect on his own people the, the citizens, there are people already stockpiling food because they know that the sanctions are coming. And of course, and I think they right, rightly say this, unless we actually grow a backbone, we're not going to put the sanctions on, at least not right away, where it really should be. We should be, basically, we should be uh, emasculating every single of these of these billionaires who's like living it up in Europe and over here in the United States. Um, you know, they're oligarchs, but we're not. We're going to we're going to do a, a token attack on those people. And we're going to basically make the citizens same thing in North Korea. We're going to the citizens are going to be who's who are not responsible for this are going to be taking the brunt of it. But I do think that's where we're going. I think we're going with ever escalating um, sanctions. And I, yeah. you know, I, I think I think Biden is completely unpredictable, too. Biden used to be predictable. Biden's 80 years old now. And I'm not going to get into the good bad you know the politics of it like whether you're a conservative or a liberal objectively speaking he is no matter what side of the aisle you are on biden like putin he's you know he's way older than putin and i think they're both potentially erratic and i think that um you know we we should i hope that we tread cautiously because these old old people i mean this is this is one of the problems being we, we, we keep electing the world keeps electing these old men and women uh, that have less that that basically are less in in some ways they become very uh, you know what's cute in my landlady like i don't want to do that or who are you or whatever that becomes terrifying in a a leader you've got one guy trying to relive you know i'm the new rome i want to go back to the old rome and over here you've got grandpa you know old, old grandpa joe going well in my day, I mean, we wouldn't put up with this, and so I, I'm, 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 I'm nervous about what's going to happen. I, I don't see though there being any stopping, the, you know, Russia from taking a big chunk of of the country. That's no matter what happens, that's going to happen. And, and here's here's why we're we're stuck as a as a country because you're right. We're not. There is no. If you if you were to remove NATO from the table, let's assume there's no there's no NATO. Right. We would have zero geostrategic interest being involved in this you know fight between Russia and Ukraine. Right. None whatsoever. However, because you know NATO is involved, if we if we kind of do nothing and look the other way, it strains our credibility here in a place in a place where it ultimately could matter, which yes. you know, there are many places where it could matter, but you know, China is watching and you know, is, is kind of looking at how we handle this and how he might. It's less about whether or not they decide to do anything with Taiwan. It's more about how they use our reaction in this crisis to manage their own alliances and relationships yes. with other countries, of course. which, you know, you know, you look at, you know, Japan, for instance, like, look, you know, look what they look what they did with NATO. They kind of just let let things let things slide. Like, why why should you work? So it plays into that, um, and it also plays into their calculus with with Taiwan. But I think the Chinese are smart enough to realize that the problem with Taiwan is that ninety percent of advanced semiconductors are manufactured on that island. And if the Chinese decided to take it, which they won't, because they're they're smart enough to realize this. We would absolutely have to go to war because every like every everything would stop. 
um, in terms of business, society, and things like that once we ran, ran down those chips. Now, that's a near-term concern because TSMC, the, the company that makes semiconductors, or those semiconductors, is building a facility in Arizona. But those things take, foundries take de decades yeah. to, not decades, but um, no, but a I read long about time. It. It's, a, it's a long-term project. Well, and this this ties into something else, you know, once again, just objective problems, not necessarily problems of ideology or politics. Exactly. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and it whether or not it's declining, you know, whatever, however you think we should be reacting to it. There are, you know, people argue over, you know, the, the stats involved, like what's really happening. But what we do know is happening is, is, is the supply chain on all levels is being dramatically curtailed and you know damaged and this is not you know it, it, in some cases that could just be oh you know us you know problems you know like you don't get your amazon toys on time or your insulin or you find out now milk you know milk's going to like eight year somebody said earlier today that like milk is going to an eight year high uh you can my my so works for a water uh, treatment company because you literally can't drink water in a lot of places here in this part of New York state without, it's not a luxury. It's a, you absolutely have to have a, a water treatment system and they're expensive. They're, you know, between five and 8,000, $10,000, depending on what you want to get. They're having a difficult time. Uh, people, they're, they're, in some cases, the wait for certain parts or certain types of systems are six to eight months because mm -hmm. already this is going to, I think there was a chance it was going to start improving. It's going to get worse potentially. Yeah. If you think gas prices are high, oil prices are skyrocketing, uh, our fuel, our, our heating, and electricity bills are projected to go up uh, twenty something percent and forty six percent respectively because of not only supply chain issues but also you know just bad weather we've had, um, which is yet another problem we need to be dealing with. So just in human terms, like a not in strategic mm -hmm. military terms or gotchas, who's right and who's wrong. Right. Um, people all over the world to one degree or another are already suffering. I, I, cause I don't think even if, if COVID lifted today and there was no more cases, I think there's that whole domino effect. All, all the dominoes haven't, haven't fallen yet. And so there's, it's going to take a while for conductors. Was, you bring up conductors. There was a huge, uh, shortage of, of of pc parts up until mm -hmm. recently because of bitcoin operators scarfing them up oh, yeah. but also just because there's not supply uh it's going to get worse and if if these guys are doing what you know if if the russians persist in in this we're we and much of the rest of the world is going to slam them with sanctions we're slamming it we're punching ourselves in the face too i'm not saying we shouldn't do it i mean i de definitely think we need to respond but we're, we're all going to be responding. We're all going to be in this, not nearly as much as the poor people in the path of the tanks, but I don't think very many people are, if this, especially if this is pro, prolonged action uh, and, and the response to it is prolonged, you're going to be paying a lot of money for milk and gas. And, and Oh yeah. Let, let me, let me, let me give you a further for even more <laughs> reasons why. Right. So Russia is a massive, well, not massive, but extremely large oil exporter. You put sanctions on that, that's going to put pressure on the supply that's coming out. It's going to raise yep. prices yep. coming out of the Middle East. Not only that, we've already, we're already in a period of, of inflation, right? An inflationary yep. period. Yep. So you add that to it. Um, third, Ukraine is a massive producer of food, mm -hmm. right? It's the breadbasket of, of Europe. Uh, like, it might not have an impact now because it's the middle of winter, but if this thing stretches for a long period of time, you're going to have a food crisis in Europe of all places, yeah. which, you know, it's going to cause food prices around the world, including, including, you know, where we live to go up. All you're going to have folly, all for the folly of an old soldier who, you know, pounding his fist on the table and or, or rattling his saber i just there's no i guess beyond saber rattling but you know what i mean this this gesture mm -hmm. that he's making whatever his justifications subjective or objective it's just a lot of people are going to suffer for no fucking reason and it's as yeah. it ever was there is no reason to be doing this Oh, and I haven't even gotten started yet, right? You're going to have a refugee refugee crisis, right? One to five million Ukrainians streaming yep. across the border into Poland. Yep. Uh, again, that's after Brexit has been like 
Ixnaid. So where are these people going to go? What are they going to do? Uh, and then uh, the other the other thing too, if people if people think that you know we're in, completely safe from Russian influence, like let me tell you about zero day of vulnerabilities and how they work, right? So like we can we can certainly you know there, there may be some elevated. That eleva- yeah, some elevated back and forth. I know that uh, I have I have a good friend who worked in cyber in the White House, and I have not been able to get get a hold of him in the last three or four weeks because I'm guessing he's extremely busy, kind of helping corporations shore up and protect against sure. you know what what they can yep. do. Even even the satellites and things that you take for granted, if the Russians wanted to you know, blind with blind us from what's going on in Europe. I'm sure they have the capability to do that, but people just don't, uh, not only that, like, you know, you, and without going into internal domestic politics, a big reason why Americans were at each other, uh, at each other's throats over the last, you know, four, four years is because you had the internet research agency, which is, you know, owned owned by one of the oligarchs in in Russia, who's also, by the way, the same owner of the Wagner Group, which is their kind of set of mercenaries, um, uh, or, or that you know that the, they hire out to to Putin and others. You know, was actively engaged in an active campaign with trolls, et cetera, to get Americans to hate each other. And frankly, it was pretty damn effective. It's right. It's, no, look, I. But like I said, without getting into the politics, um, there's absolutely there was so much disinformation. There still is. And yep. a lot of this is public knowledge at this point. It's not this isn't, you know, I'm I'm not a fan of conspiracy theories. That's why I don't that's why I'm not going to, you know, delve into all the uh, I'm not a historian. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but right. I do read the news and it is public record that there's been speeches to Congress, reports to Congress. Congress has reported on it. Facebook. To a lesser degree, Twitter, but other social platforms. But Facebook was a big one. Literally, ru- you know, Russian disinformation and other and other foreign uh, agencies, you know, with their yeah, disinformation. Chinese, right, right. You know, and 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 some of them run by Americans. So the the bot, you know, money. There's a, everybody's all worried about stock. You know, uh, whether politicians can should legally be able to trade in the stock market, which I don't think they should be. But a, yeah, not, I, yeah, don't even get me started there. <laughs> I, I'm not. I actually, I think we probably are getting close. But I. Right. Um, <laughs> I or close to the end. I, but the bottom line is, this this whole thing about being a for you know Manafort's activity and the you know in Ukraine, uh, you know old General Flynn his activities with like Turkey and you know there's a ton of them that worked for Russia. There's all this. It is perfectly legal. I think we need to look 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 hard at this stuff. I think the average American who doesn't just wants to go to work every day. I mean, I'm one of them. I just. I want to sit down and write. That's my job. I want to do that. I, I I try to stay up on the news, but this stuff is going on, and it would be very shocking. You know, lobbying on every level uh, is always shocking when it's pointed out that oh no, you can get these laws passed even though it totally screws people in a small town. They're all going to get cancer, but it was legal to do this because this lobby has paid a lot of money to those guys to vote a certain way, or or not to vote, but to you know, he contributed to the campaign. Well, right. they'd be shocked to know that it's perfectly fine, or, or at least they get away with uh, taking money from, you know, foreign powers that are in direct opposition to our national security uh, and, and policy. And I think we, I don't know what the hell we're doing as a, as a culture. I don't know why, you know, why we permit this, but we do. Well, I'll tell you one little, one, one quick story. Um, and this is, this is how, uh, so, so, so I, 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 I got a degree from the from the Kennedy School in in um, you know, international security policy, and while I was there, I gave a presentation on how the U.S. trained its forces prior to uh, you know or like right after nine eleven, like how we adapted and changed and things like that. And when I you know when I showed up to present, three quarters of the audience was mainland Chinese. So I'll just leave you with that. Like they, they, you know, especially, especially the Chinese have infiltrated so many places and they're just, and they're doing it in the open without shame. Like, it's not even like, look, I just showed up to a lecture. What's wrong with that? Right. And there's nothing I shared that was particularly, or that was, um, you know, not like that was classified or, 
even right. confidential because we would show it to we would show it to the press they come to visit and things like that but like they are listening and they are learning and you know you have to be pretty careful even even like where i am kind of near silicon valley um there's a lot of investment you know chinese investment russian investment there's a, particularly in areas of artificial intelligence and things like that and you know, there, there are a lot of things you see are like, this is a little sketchy. Like, who would I reach out to, to, you know, to, to, to figure out what, uh, or, or to notify somebody to look into something and, or to look into some of this activity. And when I asked, I asked somebody who, uh, you know, that I know who's in, in intelligence circles. And I said, like, you know, who would I reach out to? And it's like, oh, probably the FBI. And I said, well, wh- like which office, like which field office, do they have some sort of liaison with uh, companies that you could reach out to? And he asked somebody who was an FBI counterintelligence. And the guy's like, well, I mean, the best you can do is just call the local field office and hope they help out. And it's like, and the other thing too, is none of the executives out here are even remotely aware of these things. So things that I see, like I'm more likely to see things that I'm, I'm, I'm likely to overcorrect on, right? Because again, I have that, have that background and experience. So I'm going to over, um, what's the word for it? Over adjust or over solve for things that may be kind of completely harmless, but still there's no discipline. There's no, right. there's no eye on that. Right. Well, and it's scary. I don't, you know, our, our allies and neutral, you know, neutral countries, it's all, obviously we, you know, you're going to be very worried about dealing with i hate hesitate to even say countries dealing with governments that are in opposition to you know to our government but you know it applies to our allies too there's always stories coming about oh, it might have been our allies that were funding that you know incursion or that bombing or, or whatever or maybe the cyber attack or maybe they stole the stuff and i i just look at it like this has always been going on yeah One of the, it's just that it's it's a it's a it's a um there's a wild west mentality i think you know in those circles we and here's the here's the big problem is that i think it's easier to pull off than it used to be because of you would think technology would be make things easier to track and protect a lot of people that are involved in making policy don't seem to understand especially the congressional level don't understand what they should be worried about and i so it makes almost anybody with a laptop a potential you know uh, danger uh, to, to, to their own, you know, to, to their own side. So um, it, it, I guess, you know, they always talk about motive and opportunity, opportunity, motive has always been there, but opportunity is really, um, you, you're causing, uh, I, I think it's a huge cause for concern. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think this has always been, <laughs> it's always been this way. It, it's just, with the advent of the internet and things like that, we, we see more of it, right? So, uh, when you and I were growing up, uh, like there were, there were kind of three sources of truth, right? CBS, ABC, and NBC, right? And they had kind of one line that you could maybe get access to certain things, but what we saw was relatively uniform. And, and we remember that time as if, oh, you could trust the media then and this and that. And, you know, maybe you couldn't, right? Maybe they were, maybe they were tied at this at, to the hip with kind of what the you know, government wanted to put out, or they were slightly constrained because it's a there's a constant back and forth where these folks are talking. Now it's just that today, the you know the government and the kind of the big media ent- entities can't control all the information that's out there, and much of it is complete garbage and conspiracy theory and and nonsense. But some of it is stuff that the government would rather not, would rather you not know for, and for good reason, right? They're trying to protect the country, well, et right. cetera. I mean, but we, we also see people who have challenged that uh, and, you know, went to, you know, Snowden and others who have, you know, are in jail because they tried to tell stories. I was just more, and I, I don't disagree with all that. I was just more, it seems to me that there's more opportunity to I'm not talking about the information, like learning more. I think there's, there is that right. like the whole thing about the police, police have always been yeah. uh, as an institution, murdering people. They've always, we're just, I don't think it's increased. I think it may, there may be an argument that it's decreased. We're seeing it. 
Right. Uh, but that really wasn't my my thrust of what my thesis. All I was not that I disagree, but I was more just saying that I think the opportunity, if you wanted to betray, you know, your company, your country, whatever, you know, if you have information to sell, I think it's easier than it ever has been in the past to access it and to and to uh, also the it doesn't always have to be that you have secret information. It just seems to me if you're willing to spread disinformation, you could be, uh, you know, uh, quite a help to, to your point. Yeah. Like the conspiracy theories and stuff, but some of it, there's also stuff going on where, um, you know, people, like you said, the troll farms, people are being paid to lie or, or, or to, or to spin things. And so, uh, like old, uh, Roger, what's his face? Um, uh, the, uh, old Nixon guy, he's always talking about muddying the water, you know, oh, him yeah, and yeah. that him and Bannon are always talking about muddy the water. I don't think it's ever been easier uh, because you could say, well, in the past, you could pull things off on people because you only had limited information, but that works as a double-edged sword. A lot of people didn't hear things. They couldn't really be influenced in real time. Right now, man, this 24 hour news cycle. People can be, can be influenced. We, we've seen this from hour to hour, a fake story pops up or erroneous reporting on a shooting and like, it'll run like wildfire that 10 guys you know, it was a commando team did it. And then a couple hours later, and they were all from the Middle East. And then, you know, you find out within a couple hours that no, it was, you know, this, this disgruntled office worker who, you know. Well, well I, I remember, I remember it happening in nine, like after, right after 9-11, yeah. because I was in the military at the time and we had to send a <clears throat> comp, like an infantry company to like handle the next attack over Los Angeles. Right. Right. And I remember hearing, like, when, when, when the news was starting to come out, I was hearing, like, oh, something happened in San Francisco and something happened in L.A. and this and that. And then it, as things come, and, and there's, like, these, there's, like, 50 cells in the U.S. somewhere. And, and when right. it all comes down, um, you know, it's never as bad as it sounds when it first happened. I remember somebody came back and said that we had, uh, and actually, this is a true story who went down to uh, CENTCOM and, you know, he had training in like SAMS. It's like the school of advanced military studies where you know, they train you how to do advanced like planning operations. As soon as 9-11 happened, they yanked him out, sent him to CENTCOM. And when he came back, he said, expect eight to 10 years of military operations. So I guarantee we had like uh, after Iraq, we had a Syria invasion and then we probably had a had a Iran plan. Right. I'm not saying we we're going to do it, but we they, they sure. had all these things teed up for eight to 10 years of operations. And we got 20 years and, you know, we were only in. Well, uh, I, 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 should, I should leave it with this, but I just I will say this. I remember, you know, where I was when 9-11 occurred and I you know, obviously like everybody else just around the world, just stunned and scunnered as the Scots say, just totally just demoralized about, about the incident and, and the ramifications. But I remember I turned to my, to my girlfriend at the time and I just said, life has changed as we know it as U S citizens. Everything's going to be different now. And, mm -hmm. and she said, what do you mean? Like, like war? And I said, no, I said, well, who knows? I said, no, our lives here, for example, are going to change. Things are going to be completely different after this. And that's what I was talking about is that we're, you know, um, the internet, every, everything is going to, there's, there's going to be hyperbole. There's going to be, I, I, you know, I didn't know it was going to be called the Patriot Act, but that's, you know, in it's other still, words, still there, still there. Right. In other words, I, the only thing that I'm surprised hasn't happened is checkpoints and papers, please. I, I, because I, I said, you know, this, we're going, this is how we're going to react to it. This, well, this is how a lot of countries react to things. We are going to react like a body with a plague and we're going to overreact to this. And I just don't know to what extent, but we have, we did, you know, for many years. And so, um, yeah. but the only reason I say that is not to make a moral observation, but more just that you bring it up. And that is what I, you know, I, I said to her. And I, like I said, I'm no expert in this, but even I could see nothing will ever be you know, would ever be the same again for just on a day to day basis. Yeah, I just imagine somebody who wasn't born before then, like what it was like to fly. Right. I used to walk. Right? Like, I always carried a knife in Alaska. All my whole family did. And there's been more than one time I was at the metal detector and pull and, and going through my, and go, oh, I've got my, my freaking eight inch skinning knife on me. Let me go. And they're just like, yeah, okay. And you leave and you come back and it's no problem. I used to meet prior to 9 11, I used to go 
if you know if my girlfriend at the time would fly out of state and come back i would go into the concourse and you know right to the gate and meet her so yeah like i said there's no moral observation i'm not here to talk about right why you know um good bad or indifferent i'm just we knew i mean i knew i wasn't the only one but and you were right yeah that this is compared to other people it's obviously nothing like what happened to the lives of people overseas but i just meant in a quotidian sense our our lives here are you know forever changed and we're still seeing the the political i mean what's gone on the last eight years uh is politically you know from, actually from sarah palin even how she yeah. how she you know the tea party the now you've got you know these other movements the maga movement or they call it maga i always call it maga but the point is is that nothing is in a vacuum this is all and it, and it goes back to what we were talking about at the top with the supply well, chain it, it, and we it's interesting the, the end of this at all and it's interesting too because we talked about uh, and, we, and I, i'm cognizant i need to end it soon uh, we talked about the internet disseminating information and all of these movements, either you know, either MAGA, um, the Tea Party, uh, Occ- Occupy Wall Street, um, sure. kind of uh, BLM, they're all mass movements, right? They're kind of, uh, I wouldn't say anti-elite, but they're all kind of bottom up, not top down, right? Yeah, which, uh, right, sure. which is co- in complete a lot al- like uh, alignment with. The dissemination, the change in technology, and it's almost yeah. So anyway, I, I, no, I want to leave you it, with you're the, seeing it worldwide. You saw it with the uh, the I, I don't, riots is the right word, but basically the, the mass col- protest in Egypt recently over the last the color years. revolutions. Yeah, the color right. revolutions. The internet has changed, and so so like I said, I'm not saying what's good or bad. I'm just saying this is what's happening, and it's going to be good and bad. But um, yeah, I guess that, that's probably a pretty good spot to leave it. All right. Thank you, my friend. Uh, it was definitely a pleasure. And I think I'll see you <laughs> in another five days, right? We're yep. going to be on Lovecraft Easy. And so, right. so join us there. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.